So we had a great morning. We got into a lot of just sharing the presence and everything. And for me, intertwined with with all the love and joy and and peace that comes from purpose and presence is is our calling, what Jesus calls our special function, which is just the way that it seems to look for us while we're following spirit. And this is a world of many different forms, so the form looks different for everybody, but the content is the same. The purpose is the same. And so, for me, the most important thing was to come into a the living experience of the, the joy and the happiness, and then watch what extended from that in a very natural way. So, some of you who have been following along, know that there's been lots of tools, resources, books, websites, retreats, uh, many, many things that uh, are really quite amazing in, in the sense that people can access these deep teachings. And, and again, it's just to put it into practice. That's what we're all doing, practicing. And so I think um, we may talk about some of those tools, we may sprinkle some of those things in, but actually we want to uh, use this afternoon for practical application. Just about, for some people it's tuning into the calling, getting clear about the calling. For some it's, it, are there intuitive steps that are coming in? Or is there things that I'm feeling inspired by, but I still have these niggling doubts of these, these fears that are holding me back in some way. Just starting to get deeper into what, what is that? What's going on? And uh, many people seem to come to crossroads with their spiritual practice and, and want to have breakthroughs. Uh, just like in this world, there can be like certain things that you aim for, but when you're going for peace of mind, that's a very present goal. And much of the work, of course, we know with the Course is removing the obstacles. But you have to be aware of those obstacles and then let them go. So I'll open it up here for everyone and we'll spend the afternoon just having a good uh, talk on practical application. Because as Jesus says, everyone is called, few choose to listen. And we're just wanting to be the ones that are like, here I am Lord. <laughs> uh, I did have, a, I mentioned some lunches recently with Judy Scutch and with uh, her husband William Whitson and recently William was telling me the story of how he um, he had had such a beautiful full life um, working, he, he worked for the government, the Pentagon, uh, many different jobs and, and really felt really grateful for his life but he was diagnosed some quite, quite a few years ago with cancer and then he um, they told him, they diagnosed him with cancer and said, you have six months to live. And uh, he had this opportunity come up to go to China. This was actually decades ago. And he thought, wow, this is like, thank you, this is a whim. I'm diagnosed with cancer, six months to live, and I get a chance to take a trip to China to meet Mao. <laughs> and uh, he was like, wow, that's a, a nice little whim, thank you. And so the delegation uh, he told me the story, we were at lunch, he said the delegation went over to China and indeed, you know, he had his chance to meet Mao, Mao Zedong, and, and then Mao died, uh, very quickly, like in a couple days. <laughs> and then he met him, the whole delegation had gone over there from America, you know, me, but Mao died, and then there was a lot of political infighting of, you know, when the supreme leader uh, what, you know, who, who's going to take charge and all this that started to happen and everything had a little bit of a disturbance political chaos and as you might imagine it wasn't like the pre prime minister or the premier <laughs> uh, being dying or being shot this was Mao and so it was a big deal and he said the Chinese they just didn't really know what to do with this American delegation because with all this infighting and all this going on so they just they sent them off to Tibet and dumped them out on the streets <laughs> of Tibet. <laughs> and, and he was part of the delegation. So I said, well, how did that go? And he said, well, we're up there and we didn't have a place to stay and we're out on the streets. We didn't know where to get food. We're in a culture 
we didn't know how the American delegation got down. And so he was on the streets and he'd already been diagnosed with cancer and his health was going down. Uh, living on the streets of Tibet, kind of cast away and unknown uh, after this real kind of, uh, almost like a, a real revered kind of elegant life and work, working in politics and this elder statesman and all this and this. And so anyway, his health is going down and he doesn't really have much to eat and his health keeps going down, down, down to the point where he, he says, oh, looks like I'm dying reached this point and so he he said I just I just prayed to Jesus and I just said uh, hmm Jesus thank you for my life what a magnificent life I've had what a full life I even got the whim to come to China <laughs> but I wanted you know because he was loved the Chinese culture and everything and so he was just in total gratitude just dying in the streets of uh, out in Tibet somewhere, and uh, and he gave this prayer of gratitude, and then and then he says, I put in at the end. He said, Oh, and if there's anything at all you want me to do on Earth while I'm still here, uh, I'm your man. <laughs> so, so his health started to <laughs> improve radically. He he made it back to the United States. He married Judith Scutch, uh, the publisher, one of the original four with the course. And he's helped oversee the translation of the course into 25 languages. So I was recently, um, I was just there with, with uh, when Nikita came with me to one of them. I think he might have even been, he was telling us this story, one of the mm -hmm. ones we went to. But my friend Gia, who was originally parents from China and, and uh, she was from Vietnam, she was with me this time and she just burst into tears at that story. She just felt so much love. She just tears coming, she had to run into the bathroom and join us later on at lunch, but it was just a story of this gratitude of, we're just here to be of service. And that story, you know, it's it's great because if you look at the conditions as the ego judges them, it got kind of uh, dark there at the end, and yet it, the gratitude just came shining through for everything, and it, it just took over, and then out of that gratitude came the prayer, like, I can help you out with anything, I'm your man. And then, so here he is now, he's about 90 years old, and he's still <coughs> still at it, <laughs> still overseeing the translation of the Course into all these different languages. Mm -hmm. So that's a great parable of just service, that that's really the only reason we're here, and then the ego tries to distract us with many other things here, but um, as I was having lunch and I remember too, Nikita, when you were with me, I think the first two hours of our lunch, you just had one word four going through, lunch. four hour lunch, and you had one word going through your mind during the first couple hours. Behold. Just behold. It's all she heard the Spirit saying during the lunch, is just behold, behold, behold. The, the reverence of devotion, the purpose of, of hanging in there with your task, whatever your task is. And we've had some interesting things that came through those because I think at one point Judy was saying to me, yeah, Ken, Ken Wapnick kept saying to me, you know, actually, he was saying to Judy, what we're doing here with teaching, disseminating the course, translating the course, publishing the course and everything, he would tell Judy, he said, uh, all of this that we're doing is is plan B. Uh, there is a plan A. And uh, Judy said she's a little bit, why are we plan B? <laughs> and they're like, how, how could it be? The plan A was more the, the sense of the mystery school. The plan A is living it. It's, it's so embracing it. It's so aligning with it. It's so fully experiencing it that it's it's simply a state of mind that seems to look like it's in action. Almost like the world as you perceive it is like a motion picture of your beliefs. And when you get so aligned with the, the last belief, which is forgiveness, that forgiveness unifies your mind and then however the picture looks is, is, is forgiveness. It's, it's like a dance. It's a happy dance in which you're just living it. It's not like you're necessarily translating it for future generations or 
disseminating it to reach more people. You know, those are the things, that's how the ego can conceive of things. But actually plan A is the living experience of it. That a teacher of God can heal the world without a sound. And that puts everything into context. It goes beyond the words, it goes beyond all the actions and all the clearings and everything that we've come to know as a spiritual journey kind of in a linear way. And so it's beautiful because Judy said, yeah, I think uh, Helen, I think had a, a vision of like a Greek temple and there were just a small group of happy people there. It was like a vision in her mind of just living it out. And so I feel that's, that was very dear because that's been my feeling. And I think for a lot of us, we resonate with that. Not trying to think of it and put it into linear conceptual terms, but, oh yeah, that's right. The state of mind, the Beatitudes in the Bible, just living it. And getting into that involuntary state of miracles are involuntary, they should not be under conscious control, where it's like Jesus says, when you have learned to decide with God, Every decision becomes as easy and as right as breathing. And it will be as if you are carried down a quiet path in summer. It's poetic, it's simple, it's easy, it's soothing. It's the presence of love, it's the presence of grace. Where your life then becomes an involuntary expression of the divine without having to figure things out, without having to constantly keep weighing this decision or that decision, or I take this turn or that turn, it can be very stressful and very wearying trying to keep choosing among alternatives which Jesus says aren't real alternatives at all. That within us is the real alternative. There is a place in our mind where we start to we grow tired of trying to make decisions in form. How do I live my life best? What do I do? And we get more intuitive in line with our purpose. And then when we become in line with our purpose, and we become very stabilized in that purpose, then everything else is just like a natural expression and an outpouring of that purpose. So that's why, as we talk this afternoon, I think I can think of nothing more important than really tuning in to your gift, to your God-given purpose, so to speak, the Spirit's purpose for your life, and letting that purpose orchestrate the form, almost like uh, saying, Holy Spirit, paint me a picture, paint the picture of my life that is the greatest gift for the good of all. Let that be a, a painting and an expression and then coming into that quantum experience where you realize every day that's your prayer. You're just waking up and saying, okay, let's paint a great picture today for the good of the whole. You know my skills and abilities, you know my circumstances, you know everything that I'm dealing with. Now take of that, all the colors, and get that paintbrush out and just paint, let's paint a beautiful picture. That requires trust because the struggles we get into is when we believe we know something and we believe we personally have to carve out our way, find our niche in life, measure up to something, live up to some kind of standard, um, have some kind of agenda, or otherwise our lives are purposeless, when actually this is saying, no, I want to open to the purpose, and every day I want you to show me and lead the way, and I do not know the way to you, but you do. In a workbook of A Course in Miracles, there's even a workbook lesson, I choose the second place to gain the first. I need the humbleness to just show up every day and say, I don't know, uh, I'm clueless, but I do not know the way to you, but be you in charge. You are in charge, I will follow. As you get into that listen, follow, flow, the rhythm of just flowing with that intuition, a merge occurs where there isn't any more a leader and a follower. You just see that 
you are the light. And that light is just radiating and expressing and everything in the world is a dance that's expressing that love and that light. Everything in the world becomes a reflection of your own pristine mind. And how wonderful that is. So that's what I want us to do this afternoon. If there's anything that's heavy on your heart, if there's anything that's weighing, if you feel you're at a crossroads, if you feel you're at a turning point, if you feel that you have some glee and some joy and some passion in your heart, and it's like it's just bursting to come out, and then there's this wall of doubt that's just like, mm, yeah, that would be nice, but let's look at that but. Let's look at that but. What is, what is holding me back from that glorious cutting loose in that divine expression of love? Because whatever we hold in our mind is a fear or a doubt thought or even a hesitation, our mind is so powerful that our slightest hesitating thoughts can seem to keep us, not in reality, but in awareness from the glory of that experience. So that's what we want to come to, is an opening to that experience without any ifs, ands, or buts, <laughs> you know, tied in there. So I just open it up. I'm so happy to join with everybody. Yeah. I'm kind of stuck on the healing, um, maybe it's a very basic question, but I'm in the Christian Science nursing field, and the emphasis is really, you know, manifestation of transformation of your, your, your consciousness, really, and emphasis on Jesus would, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, um, and so I'm, I'm stuck on, on why healing the body is never, doesn't the body get healed just by, you know, mentally, why is there no emphasis? And of course, in miracles, there's no emphasis on 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 this healing. The body is. It doesn't matter whether it gets healed or it goes or it passes, you know. But in Christian Science, it's very much is is, is the body will be harmonious. Um, you know, the, the ideal, of course, is to be you know like Enoch or, or be translated or you know. So why why can't why I'm, I'm just sort of confused about the you know, course of miracles not um, having that manifestation physically. You know, that I, to me, I'm kind of stuck in that, that point at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. I think whether we call it symptom removal or however we would define that reflection of a, of a healed mind. Um, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier about this form and content. Um, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. So as long as there's any attention whatsoever placed on thinking something can be known about the body or known about health in the world, like health of the body, I said it's like an oxymoron, because health is inner peace and the body is, is a, a, a concept, it's a projection. Uh, as long as there's a focus on the form, then that takes away from the focus on the healing of the mind. It reminds me years ago when I was, I was traveling around, I was in Michigan and I, I went to a church, like a, a unity off, offshoot, um, and I did a talk there and a woman came to me afterwards and she said, could I meet with you later in the week? I said, sure. We met, we took a walk in the park, and she confided in me that she was a hundred percent healer. Like people would come to her and in a hundred percent of cases symptom removal of whatever they were going through. It could be physical symptoms, it could be mental issues and so forth. She she was a hundred percent healer. So we had a nice walk as we were walking and uh, she started off by, by saying, oh, I have this one question. She said, I just, I tune in, I pray, I listen and I follow what I'm guided to do and then the symptoms disappear every time, 100%. And she said, now my first question is, somebody had, a man had called in from Oklahoma with some terminal illness and maybe cancer or something, and, 
and said, I heard about you, he told the lady, and, and said, uh, I know I can join with you and be healed and everything. And she tuned into her guidance, and the guidance said, uh, have him come to Michigan. And so she said, okay, that's, that's my first question. Why would the Holy Spirit have this man come to Michigan? Uh, I said, that's your question? She said, yeah. I said, I said, well, your whole practice is based on listen and follow. Why now are you questioning the Holy Spirit? <laughs> you know, if the whole, all of healing is based on one thing, listen and follow, why have a question about the Holy Spirit's direction? She said, you're right, that's not a good question at all. That's not, that's not a really good question at all. So we keep walking in the park. And then she said, well, here's my question. She said, I pray, people hear about me, I don't have to advertise whatever people, I've got all these people calling and coming to me and everything, and she said, I, I pray, I listen, I follow, the symptoms leave them, they leave, they're happy, they're rejoicing. It just goes on over and over and over and over. And she said, a lot of them come back, they're repeat visitors, they have different, <laughs> different symptoms, pray, they're gone, they come back again, pray, listen, symptoms disappear. She says, it just goes on and on. Uh, so she looked at me and she said, uh, here's my question. What is healing? And I said, well, there is a, a workbook lesson in the Course in Miracles that says only salvation can be said to cure. And she says, you know, I'm married, I have children, I do this healing ministry, and I keep getting these prompts and everything from the Holy Spirit, how deep this goes. And, and I'm starting to see that I have to keep questioning everything that I think I am, everything I believe in. I said, exactly. That's what salvation is. Salvation is emptying the mind of concepts. Emptying the mind of identifications. The healing is the healing of perception. It's like when you look in a kaleidoscope and you turn it in all the colors. You know, we, when we perceive a world with size and shape and color, different textures, densities, and so forth. We're perceiving a world of fragmentation, and the sickness is the perception of a fragmented world. It's like watching a cracked cosmos, almost like a mirror that's cracked into zillions and zillions of pieces. That's the sickness. The sickness isn't in the pieces. The sickness isn't in the body. It's in perceiving the pieces, and not perceiving the, the whole exactly as it is. And so, um, this year, I think I was down in Australia, and um, I was out with some friends. Of course, down in Australia, the, the steering wheel is on the right-hand side, so I was on the left-hand side. We were going down the street, and there was a man who was cutting the grass with one of those powerful weed, weed whacker things. And we're driving along, and I'm sitting there, we're talking, and as we drive by, there's a guy with his headset on, and his, he's doing professional weed whacking, and apparently a, a rock got hurled out right at the car, right at the window where, next to where my head was, and it just went boom, like a bullet uh, hitting it, and then the windshield, or the window, just started to break into it looked like thousands, tens of thousands, millions of little tiny pieces, it just went and it continued on, as we, you could hear it go, it was like in motion, like the thing kept cracking as we'd sit there and go, look at this, and it kept getting tiny, and it kept going and going and going, and I, I was talking, I didn't even, I was talking about healing, and I went, now oh, that's a perfect example of the, of the fragmentation, as a, it was a boom, and then I, and we kept on talking, I said, now, see how you, you listen to it, you can hear it still seems to be splintering and splintering, you know, and still going and everything. And I look, we looked over at the guy who was cutting, he had his head since on, he was totally oblivious, <laughs> unaware of anything, and, the, and it kept going and going and going and going, until it covered the whole window. There wasn't even a spot where the, it just, and you could still hear, it was still going. And so, that turned into a beautiful teaching episode of like, the problem is not specific, the problem is the perception 
this perceiving the fragmented world. To believe that one of the fragments, like a body, could have an illness or symptoms, you're, you're perceiving inside the fragments and trying to say, oh, this, this fragment has cancer, this fragment has heart disease, you know, trying to break it up and like label the problem inside the problem, when the problem is you're seeing a distorted world that's just distorted perception. So there's many, many great lessons in the Course Workbook that address that, but Lesson 79, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. And Lesson 80, let me recognize my problems have been solved. Those are two powerful workbook lessons that say basically, even if you already have the answer, which we do, the Holy Spirit, the Atonement, it's already been solved. Even if you have the answer already, it won't do you any good as long as you misdefine the problem. If you keep defining the problem out there among the specifics, among the parts, even though you already have the answer that shows the whole is real and the parts are not, it's not going to do you any good, as long as you misdefine the problem. So some of you might have seen uh, that movie, uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? And then the sequel was Down the Rabbit Hole. I think it was the second movie where there was a quantum physicist talking about um, that idea of um, what is the marital status of the number four or five, whatever it is, number four. What is the marital status of the number four? And everyone laughs because, you know, the number four we live, it doesn't have a marital status. So you can't really ask what the marital status is. But all of our questions in this world involving specifics around the body, and why did this happen to me, and why not this, and why not that, and this and that, to the spirit, it, that's how funny the human questions are, because the questions really are just ego statements. It's really like, there's not really a questioner underneath the ego that's like saying, who am I, who am I? Did you bring home the milk I asked for? You know, that's not a real question. Human questions that seem to be real questions in, on the timeline are all funny to the spirit. The angels laugh at all the questions because the questions are nonsensical questions like what is the marital status of the number four? All the questions are. In fact, we're just asked to follow the guidance, tune into spirit, and let it flow through us, and then it will dissolve away the questions. Because the ego is the questioning mechanism of the mind. Now we can learn to start to question our consciousness. What do I believe, and what am I identified with? Those are helpful questions because they start to loosen our identification from the concepts and beliefs. But when we start pointing our finger out, why did this happen, and why did the country invade that country, and why are people this way, and you know, we're, we're just aiming our questions, it's just the ego distracting us with a bunch of nonsensical questions that we believe are real questions, but really it's just puffs of nothingness, doing nothing and going nowhere. So that's, it helped me to start to understand that, to start to, I was going to question my consciousness, and speaking of Mary Baker Eddy, because that's the core of what you're talking about, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence, and matter. It's all divine mind. So once we start to get out into the, the mortal mind, or the perceptual mind of fragmentation and separation, all of our issues and struggles are within the mortal mind. And the whole teaching of Christian science is there's no mind in matter, which means basically there is no mortal mind. And that's what heals, but that's an awakening to our Christ self, our Christ principle, our Christ essence. Who we are is an idea in the mind of God, a pure abstract idea. You might say that God thunk us into being, <laughs> and therefore we cannot make an image of ourself, we cannot make something that's unlike our spiritual creation. And every attempt to, to make creation in form, which form is temporary, creation is eternal. When, whenever we attempt to bring the eternity into form, it's just trying to do the impossible. So actually what healing is, is healing is, is 
remembering our function. All sickness is function unfulfilled. When we come back to our healing of our mind, our forgiveness, our divine expression of, of how we're guided and how we're to shine and share, that's what the healing is. And when we hold on to the belief that we can see causation in form, find sickness or health in form, find any type of causation in form, that is an example of wrong-minded thinking. Because form is not causative. Form is an unreal effect from an unreal cause. Unreal effect, images. Unreal cause, ego. True cause and effect relation. God the creator, Christ the creation. In perfect harmony. If you want a true cause and effect relationship, you have to go back to heaven to find that. And the way that we do that in this world is by simply realizing that our mind is causative, and when we line up with our purpose, we see everything and everyone is, is our mind. So everyone's a thought. Every person is a thought in our mind. When we come back to that state of hol holistic, unified field, the forgiven world, the happy dream, the true perception, you know, that's what this is all about. So also, sickness is level confusion. Anytime we perceive a cause in form, or causes and effects in form, then we, that's simply a wrong-minded perception. And in the end, that has to give way to right-minded perception. We have to start to realize that there's nothing outside of us. He says, mind reaches to itself, it does not go out. It encompasses you entirely, you within it, and it within you. Mmm, I love the flavor of his words. It's like he's describing a whole mind, holistic perception, everything completely connected. The scientists, the quantum physicists are calling it the unified field. Wow, they've tapped right in to the healed mind, to the that unified experience that that is the highest thing that you can aim for in this world. So that's kind of a, a long answer, but it just kind of orients. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes. Okay, so since we're on the subject of healing, and that seems to be where I gravitate to a lot, maybe some of the same questions, and then you brought in the whole mind. I, I completely understand, you know, the spirit in your own body, and I, I don't know how to reiterate what you said, but basically, you know, um, being, listening to it and being in tune and having the ability to, to heal or not heal your body, but to be whole. But what about the whole world? And, you know, this is where I get hung up, and the animals, because I, you know, I spend a lot of time working with animals, and I think, well, their consciousness isn't, you know, they're not thinking, well, maybe they are, but I don't think they're sitting around having negative thoughts that are created them to be ill. Now are we, is the world doing that to them? You know, so where does that all fit into the picture? What can you, insight can you give me that might make me not be like, Bleh. Yeah, well it's <laughs> like the body is part of your perception, but so are the, the trees and the mountains and the stars and the horses. You know, the perceptual world is everything of time and space, black holes, quasars, on and on and on. So, for, let's use horses. You're bringing up horses as an example. So let's use something that you can like, really relate to. Some of you might have seen Robert Bedford's movie, The Horse Whisperer. And that was based on, he actually brought in a, a real, so to speak, real life horse whisperer named Buck to come in as a consultant for that movie. And what's fascinating about his work with horses is he, he would go and visit all these different horses, and some of them were like seemingly wild horses or problem horses, but he noticed the connection between the owners of the horses and the horses, that they simply were reflecting and acting out all the issues that the owners seemed to have. And a lot of us can relate to that. You know, we've had ex experiences with pets, you know, even some people who raise their children and they're in the empty nest syndrome and they think, okay, 
got through with that phase, and then the animals start acting out <laughs> all the things that the children were acting out. It's like, oh my God, look, you're, you're, it's consciousness. So all the world is simply consciousness, and to the extent that we hold on to the ego filter, it seems like the person is apart from that external world. And it seems like there's an inner world that the person has, and an outer world, society, and a, a cosmos outside there. <coughs> As you work with the Course in Miracles, he's going to teach you through the Course that, that your thoughts and the external world that you see are actually identical. Because one of his workbook lessons, my thoughts are images I have made. The ego would have us believe that we're a person with thoughts. <laughs> And there's an external world outside of the person. But that seeming world, and that body, and everything is all just thoughts. In fact, this is a whole world of ideas. And it's purely a world of ideas. And as soon as we just recognize that we're dealing with a world of ideas, then we're back to unified consciousness. But as long as we believe there's something called consciousness that is, is in the human, or part of the human, and then there's an external world, We've got conflict going on, because we're not wanting to recognize we're all together, we're all in this together. We're still this idea that I'm over here, you're over there. That the inner and the outer are different. People will even talk about that in spiritual circles. They'll say, well, my inner world's doing pretty good, but the world's a mess out there. And they're still not starting to really see that, no, the world is just a reflection of my thoughts. If I see I'm upset with a war, or mistreatment of animals, or all kinds of conflicts that seem to be out there, or even intra-psychic conflicts, it's all, it's all the same. And that's where the mind training of A Course in Miracles comes in, because as long as I perceive there's a world outside of me, and that there's people outside of my mind that are not acting according to my will, <laughs> they seem to have minds of their own, so do the animals. People will say, that cat's got a mind of its own. Well, and it goes without saying, people seem to be have a mind of their own and everything. Then there's still not an awareness that it's all just thoughts. It's still a trick, a mind game of like, the inner opposed to the outer. And it seems like an impossible situation, which is why, what's the leading cause of death in the world? Death. Suicide. And, and suicide, is, you know, it comes from this desperation. Almost like uh, everybody believes they got a riddle to solve, and nobody's solving the riddle. And at some point people get so tired and so fatigued and so tortured by the riddle of the human condition that they just say, I'm just going to end it. Thinking that that's like the solution, but that doesn't, that doesn't get you anywhere. You don't rest in peace when you still have conflict. And you believe death is an escape. Part of us intuitively knows death isn't the way out. We've got to come to forgiveness to come to eternal life. We need a reflection of life to lead us to eternal life. Death is never going to take us to life. R.I.P., rest in peace, you know, it's not that you can simply die to be free of the ego. In fact, Jesus goes one step further. He says, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm going to do my forgiveness lessons right now. Thank you. What's the next step? If the ego is going to pursue me beyond the grave, I'll give up ideas of, well, I'll finally make it to old age and die. That's not <laughs> going to get it. Sounds like a problem. <laughs> that, that sounds like a, a problem. Meaning, I need to let go, let go that ego. <laughs> you got to come back to this. Yeah. Yes? For the um, practical application, can you talk more about relationships and the special love relationships, holy relationships? Are they real? Or are they just ideas? And how do we, for practical application, how do we Yeah, that's good. It's kind of following up on Joel's question of the, about 
romantic relationship. It says, go a little deeper under the surface. So there's nine chapters on relationship from 15 to 24. Jesus talks about special love rela relationships and special hate relationships. For most people, when they're reading through that, they can they go, oh, I know what you mean by these special hate relationships. Because they can think right off the bat, you know, who do I really hate? <laughs> he's got to be talking about this one. We can name them off, you know. Aha! He's got a word for it. Special hate relationships. There they are. The special love relationship is a little sneakier because it's the, it's the same hate, but it's dressed up in a disguise. So instead of being, just get away from me and get out of my face, and I, good riddance to you, I hope I never see you or speak to you again, it's more like it's coming back like a ghost. But it's dressed up in a very attractive form. <laughs> now, I fooled you. <laughs> Here I am. It's the hatred showing up dressed up uh, in a very attractive form. Because if, if you can really recognize guilt at the core of it, you wouldn't be fooled by any form the ghost takes. You would just go, ha, 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 sorry, not biting on that one again. The ego is so clever that it dresses up guilt in attractive forms. And it can be relationships, it could be chocolate, you know. You could have a special love relationship with chocolate. Many people do, you know, they'll say, I'm through with relationships, but I'm not through with chocolate. <laughs> and it doesn't have nearly the heartaches <laughs> the other one. I'm not giving the chocolate up. You know, but they start to, there's some sections in the course, you know, during those chapters where he starts off and he's got um, three subsections in a row. One's um, attraction to guilt. The subsection, when, it, when it's titled attraction to guilt, you know, you look at it and you go, oh, attraction to guilt, there it is. Then the next one is attraction to pain. Oh, this book's not going to sell. Whatever, no wonder the course is not selling. And then what's the third one? Attraction to death. When you put three subsections, try writing a book and putting those as three titles on there and see how, how well that one sells. But Jesus is not really concerned with selling. He's concerned with giving to you straight. So attraction to guilt, attraction to, to pain, attraction to death are all the same. The ego will take some forms of the projected world and make them attractive and some forms make them very unattractive. Love and hate, and then you're, you're attracted to the love and you're repelled by the hatred, and yet it's still projecting out a world in which there seem to be differences. Differences, witnesses of love and witnesses of hate. As long as we're still seeing dualistic witnesses, what does that mean about our consciousness? It still means we have a split mind and we're still calling forth conflicting witnesses. So in the end, you know, Mother Teresa and Hitler are the same from a healed mind. Or um, male and female become the same. Or, to use a more extreme example, birth and death become the same. Uh, and even, have, have any of you ever seen the movie Solaris with uh, George Clooney? At the very end, his wife, Rhea, is, appears to him <coughs> once again at the end of the movie, and he's just totally amazed that she's back there again on Earth. And he's got this look of, of wonderment, and he said, Am I dead, or am I alive? And Rhea says, We don't have to think like that anymore. That's the answer to, am I dead or alive? In the end, what the ego calls dead and alive seems to be a big deal. That's why people get outraged with murder. Because the, the, the death seems to be real, and life seems to be real. And as long as life and death are projected out to the world, then there's, it still means the mind is still conflicted. And it's not really ready to open up to eternal life. So, in the end, that's the most, that's the answer to the question is the sense that you practice with the relationships and anything that you judge positively or negatively about the form of the relationship is a, is a forgiveness opportunity to bring it back and go, oh, that's my, that's my thought. I can't blame 
my partner, neither do I want to blame the body either, because the partner, the body, all of those things are, are actually neutral to the Holy Spirit. It's just that the ego is projecting all this meaning, and when it projects the meaning, it's also looking for its salvation, you know, looking for a better partner constantly, looking for a more peaceful environment constantly. I want to find the right people, the right this, you know, as if we can find the formula of just getting the Rubik's Cube of the world, just getting the form just right, and then I'll be happy. And it's really, no, we need to purify our consciousness, and then we'll see the whole world from a happy state of mind. See how empowering that is? That's, what's that? Empower Health, is that the name of it? Yeah. We're here in Empower Health, and now we've just <laughs> taken it all the way, you know, to what Empower Health is really all about. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. You, you first look inside, and then you look out on, upon a world that just reflects what you found when you looked within. So if you go for the purity, the forgiveness, then suddenly the world is benign, and, and the world is a blessing. Everything is a blessing. Yes? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a very good, deep question. I mean, you start to get into readiness and willingness. We're getting really deep. Now we're getting down into the deeper chambers of the mind. The Helen Schuckman, the scribe of the Course, one time was having lunch with uh, Judy Scutch and Willis Harmon, a very famous um, transpersonal psychotherapist. And then Willis Harmon had to go off to catch a flight, and and uh, so he's asking. Um, Helen Schuckman to just summarize the course, just summarize what, what you feel about the course, because he's got to go and catch an airport, and, and, and so Helen goes, oh, well, you know, I know it's true, I just don't believe it. <laughs> that's her quick, as he's getting ready to go out to the airport, that's her quick summary, I know it's true, I just don't believe it. And here she was scribing, she'd already scribed it, and done a great job, I mean, it took seven years of, you know, really going through a lot of intensity. 
And then Judy, just recently at lunch, she told me, she said, well, actually, she said to Helen, you know, that's not entirely true. She said, you should have told him, I know it's true, I just don't want to believe it. Yeah. Judy kind of reminded Helen at that point. See, the thing about it is, you know, you've seen my, I've got diagrams and levels of the mind, it's, it's all there in books and on the internet. All you have to do is just go avail yourself of all the stuff that's there and it's just as easy as one, two, three. You just have to see it and and give yourself over to it and be shown. Demonstrate, let the Spirit bring it to you. But in terms of readiness, this is a quality of the mind that that is not like in time and space. Like people will say, what did I do in this lifetime to be so afraid of this or to be diagnosed with that whatever. The readiness to wake up is not something that's in time and space. You know, it, it, there was an a American president, president, I was just uh, talking to Helena about this, it was uh, Abraham Lincoln, some of you have heard of Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln said, a mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. <laughs> <laughs> Profound from a president. <laughs> you know, it's like, he was praying a lot, you know, the Civil War, and he was really diving deep. So, the Course keeps saying, you know, you need, a, you need to keep practicing this little willingness, this little willingness, keep practicing your little willingness, little willingness. And then eventually he says it takes great willingness to see that all events, outcomes, circumstances are, are helpful. Great willingness. He throws the great in there finally, after all the little willingness things throughout the Course, saying it's going to take really a devotion to come to see that all things work together for good, and there's no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. So whenever you say you beat yourself up, you're just still looking at the form, and you're making a conclusion. It could be anything. Why am I not getting this? I can't apply the ideas. I'm never going to, you know, the ego's got this whole litany of defenses, and, and yet, um, another thing that uh, Helen and I were talking about was this, like, the, the mind, it's all for, for the mind, all the lessons, but, but it's, it's more of a vibrational thing, like things, everything is working together for your good, everything that seems to be occurring, and the ego is just defending against that, and interpreting, interpreting and saying, judging against it, even though everything is always in this divine flow, and it's all working together for the good. It's just the ego's interpretation is, oh no, this has gone wrong, well this proves this, you know, it's always trying to defeat the mind, it's always trying to dismiss the miracles, dismiss the love, and always come back with that darkness. So, I would just say, you know, come back to the, what's the prayer of the heart, is you keep hanging in this whole interpretation of Lyme disease and the way that seems to be playing out. This was all, it's all part of a prearranged plan. This was all selected. At some point as you keep going into the healing, you're just going to have this burst of laughter and go, my God, what? I, I really tried to make it a rough case from the ego's point of view, and the spirit was gently there at every turn. Did you get it? Oh, try this one. Did you get it? That's okay. You try this one. Did you get it? Like the angels are so playful, they keep like spinning the Rubik's Cube. Don't worry, you're going to get it. Like you would with a child. When a child's taking its first steps, you know, and falls to its knees, you don't scold the child, you know, you're like, oh, and you go and you're encouraging that child to go from crawling to walking. Always offering encouragement. We have to be the same with our mind. Encouraging, encouraging, not quick to find fault and shut down and, and judge and be critical, you know, we, we need to be this the same kind of way.
Yes. That's it. Everything properly perceived is an opportunity for bringing love back into awareness. So it's that properly perceived, that's why we go so deeply into perception, you know, into seeing the healing perception, because everything is a gift. The ego has its own <laughs> interpretation of that, like, yeah, I'm great. You know, it will say, oh, thanks a lot, you know, for this, because it's already judged against, but everything is, is aimed at the same, same healing. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, I, I, well, just you asked about um, direction, and if you're going, anyway, I've just come off of a major six-year stint of doing a job, and I've given myself some time to what direction I'm going. This kind of personal stuff, it's okay. Um, well, uh, so, where am I at? Um, you know, I thought I had this idea I was going to create this children's game, which I've always wanted to do, and it's been in the back of my mind, and I have to go back to school and create all this stuff. So I kind of let go of that, and I'm just watching where I'm going, and I've gotten involved in um, sort of some conservation work in House Sound and a biosphere with, you know, and that's kind of exciting. And then I've got this opportunity to work with a girlfriend into counseling if I want. I also have grandchildren, I also have this, I have that. So I, I just, I'm kind of excited, but it just feels overwhelming. And I don't have the language, or maybe I'm, that's what I'm asking for, the language to choose. How do I get in touch? Okay, what's the next step? Is this the right step? Uh, fears come up. Uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of exciting stuff happening. I'm not... I'm not jumping in yet, quite. I'm not sure if I'm aligning myself. And I am anxious that I've got all these responsibilities. Like, I want to spend time with my grandchildren, but they're, they're a balance, right? I'd like to do this, be part of this group that looks at preserving this World Heritage Site. Um, I don't want to get into a fight or, f and then I wouldn't mind doing some more, uh, some counseling, maybe part time. So I just am in transition. So you mentioned that, and I thought this is a good place to bring it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes when you're in a place of transition and crossroads, uh, it's good to understand a little bit of the dynamics or the how the spirit operates. Because remember, the spirit wants you to bring the illusions to the truth. It wants you to, to expose any dark thoughts and dark beliefs, bring them to the light. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of this movie that Guy Ritchie, uh, Madonna's ex-husband, made called <coughs> Revolver. Uh, it's a very healing movie, and one of the lines in it is basically coming from the Holy Spirit character in the movie saying, where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. In other words, where you don't want to go in your life experience, that's where you're going to find the ego. It's the master of hiding. And that movie, at the end you see David Hawkins and Deepak Chopra and all these uh, amazing teachers kind of at the, during the credits, you've seen at the end, but they're basically saying, you know, where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. The master trickster. So, if you're honest and you start to look at your life instead of like thinking, well, I'm so and so years old and I've got some years left in my life, what is it on my bucket list that I haven't done, or what excites me in this and this and this, you start to come inward more to a self-honesty like, what really terrifies me? <laughs> That's the kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves. What really scares me, you know? And then, where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find it. That's where you'll expose the trickster, you know, by going to that. Now, Helen Schuckman was working with Jesus, and basically Jesus said, she was a psychologist, and so she was used to working with clients and defense mechanisms, and Jesus did tell her, uh, don't ever, don't go for the jugular with <laughs> any of your clients. You know, don't work with the primary defense mechanism, work with the secondary defense mechanisms first, build up trust, build up confidence, and then you go in. But, but Revolver, which is kind of more of an ultimate movie of, of healing, uh, basically some of you have seen the movie now, there's the elevator scene, when uh, he's going down, what's his name? 
Jack, Jack Green. Jack Green. Jake Green. Jake Green. Jake Green. Green's in that elevator. In the movie, he's afraid of tiny spaces. And so where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. So he has to go into the elevator shaft instead of taking the stairs, which is just more of a detour or resistance. And when he gets in there, then the elevator stops. You know how it gets it's between floors and it stops and then the electricity goes off and everything. So darkness and tiny spaces are Jake Green's <laughs> greatest fears. And that's where he's going to find the ego. The ego just comes out of its hiding place. You know, what are you without me? You're nothing without me. And you know, it starts to really come at him really hard. And basically the ego, after it goes through its tirade of kicking, screaming, banging and everything, it's, it's, the ego says, you are me. And then he's got to come into his space of, you're not, I'm not you. I'm not an ego, and I'm not you. You are me. You'd be nothing without me. No, I'm not you. And then he goes into the serene state, which is the enlightened state, when he faces his greatest fear, which is an, un an unworthiness and an insufficiency around identity. That's what we're, we're zooming down to face. You see how different that is from kind of like, oh, I'm a human being, I've had a good life, I'm growing old, what's on my bucket list, and what is it that I can, it'll bring me some excitement and in interest to, hmm, you know, maybe I, at some point, bought into this idea of, of worthiness, and I played small. What areas of my life am I still playing small? What areas of my life am I still people-pleasing, still acting for approval, or acting for somebody's response? Um, in terms of responsibilities, if, if it seems like you're overwhelmed with responsibilities, that's just a sign that, oh, I need to take a close look at that, and come back in and say, where is my true responsibility? These things, if the ego set things up to keep me in guilt, and my responsibility is to be divinely happy, and my responsibility is for the whole universe too. It's not just a personal responsibility. I'm here as a, in the matrix, you are the one. You know, I, I'm here because I've been told I need to wake up and accept that I am the one. Then you can start to face, where am I compromising? Where am I still playing small? And that's a tremendous opportunity. So those little points of transition are really cracks of opening, where you can kind of really be true to your divine self and say, ah, show me here. What is it? What is it that is really calling me right now? Asking for that. Yeah, asking for that. Being worthy of asking for that, because you deserve that. That's your natural inheritance. To show, to show me. Yeah. yeah. That's a great prayer. Show me. Spirit, show me. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I'm drawn to uh, suffering children. You know, I can sometimes completely detach, well, completely detach, no. I can pull out and it is one. And it is exactly as it should be, as I am, as we all are. And then my mind goes to like child slavery, human trafficking, child prostitution, pornography. And so this, you know, take that child and out of there, put that child in front of me with all this devastation. I couldn't. How could I, you know what I mean? This desire to like alleviate the suffering some way. And then the smallness, right? There's this smallness of how can I do this? I want to do this. I want to go, you know, relieve one or the thousands of children on this planet. And yet, um, it's my is that my perception? That a child that is beaten and kept and chained and hungry and you know, recently, somewhere, I, I, one that really impacted me was this child in Africa that was crawling in the dirt, and people
people were just looking and they're like, I, I don't, they didn't even know what to do with it because it was so there. They had to pick it up. Is it going to break? It's this way. And I'm like, I, I, I could not, I could not resist to alleviate that in any way with anything that I have. Yeah. And that is just. It's it strong. never goes away. Yeah. I can never, it never goes away since I became you know, aware of this and started to look even more so and recognize that it's everywhere. Where do I start? I, <laughs> even though the Lord's taking care of everything, how do I facilitate? I'm your man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take me there. Yeah, that's the, that's the cracking open. Because it's like when there's all these blinders that have been put over that there's layers and layers of trying to um, trying to cover over the guilt, cover over the pain, cover over the, the suffering. It's like layers and layers of a false world yeah. that's built up with many distractions. Like, look over here, don't look there, look over here. And then you you start to open up to your calling. It's That's a really, what you're describing is a good example of what I was just speaking about. Where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. In, in the sense that you're being drawn in through this perception yeah. and this is literally the way it's designed in the plan for you to wake up to, to reach that place of empowerment and for me you know it's what it does I think experientially it just keeps popping you past comfort zones whatever ego comfort zones we seem to have <laughs> boom yeah. and then boom, oh yeah it's and big. just pop it's huge it's, it's very powerful like, I was very shy and I didn't like to travel and all these things. Everything that I didn't want to do <laughs> is the way the spirit, spirit says, okay, well, you'll be good for that. You don't like to travel, we're going to have mega travels for you. Uh, you don't like to talk, you're shy, you're quiet, you're a wallflower and everything. Oh, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll, we'll fix that. You know, it, it's like we'll use, use you. When you're willing to be used, that's how the cracking open happens. So for me, going to third world countries was a part of that as well. Because you had this, almost like an altruism, this deep love, this deep desire to, to alleviate suffering and, and extend love. It's just a huge, like a, like a dam full, full of, of love that's ready to burst, burst out. And, and how it's done is, it's moment by moment, you know, for me, taking me and taking me off to third world countries and putting me in situations where I had this huge desire to be helpful, but I had to be shown. Yeah. Almost like I'm a novice and I'm saying, show me Lord, teach me. How can I extend this? So drawn to uh, all corners. How can I be love in action? Like I was down in Colombia one time where the vast majority of the country lives like on two dollars a day and so I'm out, I'm giving different talks, and I go to this one talk, and I give the talk, and this man and this woman come, and they said, we're from uh, an orphanage, and we, we heard your talk, and we just, please, can you come with us to the orphanage? So I said, sure. So there I go, I go to the orphanage, and mostly this whole orphanage, it wasn't just an orphanage, it was an orphanage for HIV, children, babies, all the way up, you know, that, that have been abandoned, left out there, and so on and so forth. So it's basically the what whole it. So as I'm getting ready to go, um, a woman who also had been in the group, she comes to me and so she just says, oh, my teenage daughter, she's so lost and she's she's got all these marks all over her wrist from all the times she's tried to kill herself, just marks on her arm and everything. And she's She's just a teenager, and I brought her. I brought her along to see you. I, I think if my daughter could just spend some time with you, that could help her break free from that. And so I thought, hmm, this is perfect. Bring her along to the orphanage. So we all go. We stop by. We rent. We rent a movie, Pocahontas. We buy candy, all kinds of things, and we go in with these HIV babies, HIV children, and we're there, and we're. They're just to extend love, and we go in there with all our supplies to do it, and we're with all these kids, and I remember watching Pocahontas, and there's a little boy down on my lap, and I'm just holding him, this little HIV 
like this boy, and I'm holding him and loving him and cuddling him and loving him. And at one point during Pocahontas, he just looks up at me with his big eyes and just goes, in, in Spanish, he goes, you are my daddy. And it was, there was just the opportunities that when you have all this love to extend, the Spirit will bring all the circumstances because everything's love or a call for love. And we need to break out of those ego comfort zones and these constructs of identity, and that's how the Spirit does it. It's always stretching us past all these ego uh, concepts and ideas because it's got all this love that wants to just pour through. So, if you just, it's like you follow your heart, if things really call to you and there's a strong feeling and, and almost like an urgency with it, that's like the Spirit nudging you, like, good, good, I will go before you, I will set it up in a way that will keep expanding your perception, where your perception keeps expanding through these miracles and love keeps pouring through, and that's how the cleansing a way of, the, of suffering, because the ego perception is where the suffering comes in. It's always some kind of distorted lens. God didn't create suffering. It's the ego that's distorting something, and the Spirit sees that as a call for love. Where, like when I've been in Buenos Aires, going around and the kids are juggling and doing all those things to bring in money for their families so they can eat. You know, going around, my friend and I giving little angels, little coins, the Spirit will use the symbols in order for it to be impactful and helpful in a way that, that you feel your heart expanding. And that's what we need to do. We're not, there's no way that you come to spiritual enlightenment through concepts of thinking, I'm just going to learn this book and memorize it. You know, it's just, it doesn't work that way. It's the doing part. Yeah, the, the action. The doing part. Yes, the, the action part. part, right? Yes. It seems so large. Yeah. The, the, there's so many. Yes. So much opportunity. It's a constant, like, there's no question about what to do. Like, yeah. can't get bored in this lifetime. It's so... <coughs> we're all miracle workers. Yeah, so you know, we're, constantly we're all being called into our miracle working functions. That and is that's not ego, right? That is not, I need to save you. No. Because I couldn't say, it's just like, I just want to give you some rice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or whatever. That's the involuntary of nature of the miracle, when, whenever I've heard teachers say, well, you know, it's just an illusion. I remember asking Holy Spirit and Jesus about this, it's just an illusion stuff. And it's interesting that Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, never went around uh, talking about the world as an illusion. He just was going around in, in love and gentleness and friendliness and extending. I think it was only the Gospel of Thomas, where Thomas had uh, said to him, I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell anyone because it'll bring fire down on our heads. Well, that kind of language is basically Jesus saying, listen Thomas, let's use some discernment here. We're supposed to be the living representation, the demonstration of love. I use my parables, I use my teachings, but don't go telling people that this is a desert or this, this is a, an unreal planet. Because that's trying to heal from the top down. That's the biggest problem the Course in Miracles teachers has, is they try to take a primary teaching from the Course and try to convince their spouses, their parents, they try to get it into the Vatican, get it into the Pope's hands. I mean, you should hear some of the stories I hear in this place. A little bit of level confusion going on there, because it's this idea that well, if I could only convince so-and-so that the world's an illusion, who's trying to convince who? <laughs> you know? If you come to that experience and, and your state of mind reflects that you have nothing to defend, that you're holding on to no values of the world, then your state of mind will be a tremendous teaching and healing, because that's true empathy. But I've heard stories of people, you know, going in, somebody's in, in the hospital in traction and banging on the, the cast going, it's an illusion! You know, like, it's like, oh my God. You know, it's, when you take something as deep as the Course and as metaphysical, and you and the ego gets a hold of it, you know, it will just try to use the words. And it's not coming from a presence. It's not coming from that deep connection. So I, I really feel this is your, your inroad. You need to pay attention to that huge calling. 
Every day. Every, I do every day. Yeah. You're just ex seemingly extending outward. <laughs> it's very large. <laughs> and I'm just like, I need some people with me because this is too much for I'll go, no problem. But it's just seemingly so large that uh, it's everywhere. Yeah. To be present. The opportunity arises constantly to be present anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. I have to focus on those little ones because the thought breaks my heart open. Well, that's great that you're expressing that too because I feel Jesus says miracles are a collaborative function and uh, collaborative expression. And so that's the way it's gone in the parable of David where I go out, I just love to join, collaborate. It's the collaborative vibe, you know, where in one sense, if you're in the miraculous state of mind and there is an action component involved, the Holy Spirit will, will give it, and actually do it through you. He says, it cannot be difficult to do the task that Christ appointed you to do, for it is He who does it. The Spirit will come rushing through you, and there can be an action component to it. Whereas, a lot of times when people intellectualize the Course, it's just sitting around in groups going, that war is not real, that child suffering is not real. You know, if, if if they would come into an actual experience of that, it would change the per their whole perception of the world. But the ego is so frightened of that love that it, it will use intellectualizing and oftentimes just even studying the book. I, I have met people that study the book for 20, 25, 30 years and it's like do the workbook lessons over and over and over and and really he's calling us to live it, you know, to really live it. So if you're calling out for connection and collaboration, it's great that you're making a public statement of that. We're constantly doing that. We're always, I'm always saying to people, join me. Come and join me. You know, see how much fun this is. Let's do it. I travel with different people, go to different places, joining people in different cultures, different languages. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, that documentary that they did on George Harrison, of his life, that was so touching to me, that he, he not only went over to India, but he got so involved, he had so many facets of his life where he was connecting and collaborating with people. It just warmed my heart to watch him going here, there, forming a, band, a rock band, another rock band, Tom Petty and different ones, passing out ukuleles to people, uh, even with his, his first wife, I think I remember in the documentary, she ran off with uh, Clapton. Eric Clapton. Abby. Yeah, and, and he was like, is that really what you want? Then go, you know? <laughs> Just imagine having the kind of love and presence if, if your partner came and said, no, I'm, I'm really interested in this other guy <laughs> more than you. <laughs> to have the state of mind to say, okay, then go. And then it made way in his life for, I think, Olivia to come in, and what a reflection as they went. You see, we make space when we are authentic, when we, we don't try to, 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 to keep up with appearances, keep up with the Joneses, be afraid of what other people would think, but he was really into the collaborations, using collaborations. What, that big thing he did to raise all that money, a bank concert for Bangladesh. Concert for Bangladesh, like groundbreaking kind of things he was doing. Like you said, there's lots of opportunities, and he just was like, okay, I'll take that one, and I'll take that one too, and that one, and that one, and that one. He was jumping in beyond ego comfort levels and just getting into the love. And I think that was a great example for all humankind, just to see that... Uh, my heart just lit up when I saw that uh, documentary. I just was like, wow, what a life. That's amazing. Yes, did you have your hand up? Me? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. I was just wondering how you ever left that little guy who looked up at you and said, you're my papa. Well, it, for me, it's so much in the moment that that's that loosening of of time, because all of us have had that experience with, with loved ones or something where it's like that Sarah Brightman song, you know, it's time to say goodbye. Um, from the ego lens, goodbye is the, one of the hardest. That's why when people, even loved ones even physically die, there's, there's a lot of grief, almost like there's a belief that the communication is broken. That touch, that, that care, that close intimacy, 
somehow something's been lost. And underneath all that is this belief in loss that Jesus says in the Course, you have many strange beliefs, but perhaps the strangest of them all is the belief that you can lose the ones that you love. That's interesting coming from Jesus. So for me, how I was talking this morning about getting into a life of giving, when you're into that giving mode, giving, 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 going round and round, and you just your whole life becomes a, a symphony of giving, you are filled up, because that's our function. Our God-given function is to, to give as God gives, freely. And I remember that movie uh, called Always, the Spielberg movie with Holly Hunter and Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, there was some kind of line in there, in that movie, where the, the only pain we carry with us is the love that we withhold. When I heard that line in that movie, I was like, oh my God, that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, what's been my mind withholding that is bringing the, the pain, the suffering, the... I need to get into this giving. And that has been like a calling for me, is to really get fully into that, to not hold back in any way. And in that sense, you know, it, it's been, there isn't, there isn't a separation anxiety, there isn't a, a sense of um, losing something. Uh, like even in my life, the, I travel so much that probably the most common face that I saw in my life was my three-legged cat, uh, tripod. <laughs> you know, and so, and I had this kind of telepathic thing with this cat that it was like, an, the cat was like saying, I'm with you, I'm with you for the duration, I'm with you for your whole life, I'm going to be here as a companion for you. And then, whatever that was, a couple years ago or something, when tripod started to go down and passed away, and, uh, literally in my bed, we had had a little meditation or soft sign, it was so much love, the whole house was just filled up with all this love. And then, uh, and then I went off on my travels again, and when I came back, there was a kitten there. It's almost like, it's like, I'm back, now, <laughs> I was female before, but now I'm male. I had three legs before, but now I've got four, watch me go, and, and I'm with you all the way, I still, I'm still here. They're even saying the meow is the distinctive meow. It's almost like it's identical. It's like I'm back. I, the form has changed, but I'm right with you as a companion here all the way through everything. So you get more and more that feel that that you don't really lose anything in the giving. You just feel that that connection, that love. In fact, didn't we do it was a video recently that all addiction. Mm -hmm. Is a call is for a call connection. For is a call for connection. Yeah. yeah. All addiction is a call for connection. So, whatever form the addiction takes, it doesn't matter. It's really a call for us to connect and to extend the love. And we're all capable. That's why we're here having this talk. We're we're ready. We and there's so many ways to connect. So many ways through the the meetings. I mean, I look around the room different places we've cr crisscrossed around the world, and Richard, and Lisa, you know, we've had all these different interconnections, and it just keeps going on and on, and growing and growing, and to me, that's what this is all about, you know, you just keep going with that, what, what really lights your heart up, what really brings you joy, and, and watch whatever those niggling doubt thoughts are that would hold you back from that collaborating and connecting, because those are the ones that have to be exposed, you know, they, they're being brought up by that, that connection, that flow. That's such a powerful quote, I have heard that. The only pain we carry is the love we need. Yeah, that just hit me so strong in that Spielberg movie, and his, his Dreyfus, Richard Dreyfus delivered that one. Yes, Rick. Uh, I feel like I'm the elephant in the room in terms of healing. Um,
slowing down, I see life, I see it more completely, more completely in that I don't glance over anything now, Exactly the same. I experience it differently. I receive uh, support beyond my wildest expectation in terms of the friends who have come forth about me. And I'm just filled with whatever God. <laughs> uh, so just breaking out of self-imposed restrictions. I don't believe I, I, I don't believe I'm asking questions because I'm not sure I have an answer. Or even ask the right question, going back to I don't know. So there's an allowance that's coming, and an allowance of absolutely everything. And in that allowance, how things unfold now, it's absolutely I can feel it. I really can feel it because I, knowing you, Rick, and, and in the years that I've known you from up in Vancouver Island and, and down 
the monastery and different things and and how you just opened your house up to community coming in there and were just so willing to let those eager ego comfort layers and zones just keep getting popped and popped and now with the the diagnosis it's it's quite common when there's a diagnosis because it's there's a shift in the perspective of time it can be like an extreme slowing down and a noticing and a focusing that was never there you know you can start to feel the gift with that uh, of course with all of our movies movie watchers guide to enlightenment but I think it was Robert Redford's daughter who made a film I think, was it called the red guitar uh-huh. where she's oh, or, or the, hold on. the guitar the guitar just, just the guitar, the guitar. where yes. she's diagnosed with a terminal illness and she goes to work and she loses her job and then she goes into this the whole movie is this amazing phase of allowance the allowance that she hadn't given herself since she was like a little girl all kinds of things of trying to do you know and confine and she just gives herself such allowance and she starts to use her credit card to just <laughs> <laughs> she goes wild on this credit card and all the encounters and everything she draws into her from this diagnosis kind of state to the point that she actually goes into remission you know because it's such a full turn and uh, I think one of his last year or two years ago was that the Spain and Mallorca was that a couple years ago or last year last year last year around this time uh, six six weeks I was over there for the last four but a six-week devotional that we have from time to time and there was a woman who came there and she waited until pretty far into it to say that she had been um, diagnosed with cancer and terminal illness and so on and so forth but she came out of it in a total remission of, of just that six weeks of just giving herself over and all the dismantling and all the undoing all the release of guilt and I think that final month I was there, I would be doing like a metaphysical movie uh, every night. Like, come on, join me, take, we're going soaring. Forget ayahuasca and ecstasy and drugs like that. I'll take you. We're going on a trip <laughs> every night, a, a nightly movie session where I'd take them a deep metaphysical movie and we would just all go soaring together. And then, yeah, by the end, that was part of her testimony was that, yeah, she came in with cancer and she... And she dropped that one, too, on the way through. I think the key word you said is allowance. You know, we really have to allow ourselves to the fullest to really come into what is the calling of our heart. And, and we're not going to be denied. We're not going to be held back from that. We're not going to buy any of those ego excuses. You know, we're going to fully go into that. I think that is the gift, what you're sharing, is it's, it's been a gift. It's whatever form, the Spirit knows the way, whatever form that is used as a reflection or a way to assist us in, in opening further and further into that allowance is amazing. And that I love how we can do that with relationships, we can do that in all aspects of our life in terms of our jobs, our vocation, children, we can we can just open up to what's possible like say spirit you show me you lead the way and it's just a beautiful testimony that you're you're seeing that you're experiencing that you're acknowledging that you're acknowledging the value of that that's that's truly what it's all about and I've done that with people for years I I uh, volunteered and um, hospice. I was actually training to work at a hospice many, many, many years ago, and then this this minister was also training beside me, but we went out to Wendy's one day, and we're having lunch, and, and he said, yeah, I've been diagnosed with cancer, and it's lymph cancer, and it's spread, and da da da, and the whole diagnosis thing, and everything, and as we sat there eating our fries and our Wendy's burgers, and just kind of looking me in the eye, and just saying, hmm, is there somebody in your life that was close to you that you're not talking to? Mm. And he's like, ah, how did you know about my sister? <laughs> and I, we had a nice lunch, and I said, well, listen, your assignment is bury the hatchet. 
you call her, you talk to her, there's so much love there, but you have not been communicating the love in your heart that someone is very dear to you and everything. And I told him, I said, you know, everything we experience with the body is just a reflection of mine, and this is, is what you need to do. Well, he, I didn't see him for a couple of weeks, but when he came back, he went in and he went into total 100% remission from kind of, from extensive cancer just went boom, just popped around like that because he, he was willing to listen to what I had to say. And he, there was a grievance underneath everything in this world that seems to be any kind of discomfort or ill at ease, there's a grievance that we still haven't raised up. And he was so willing, he just came up to that and he just stepped right into it. And so, I think that's what the opportunity is right now. You know, you're just giving yourself that allowance that show me, that step-by-step -step show me, and everything slows down. Including, I think, remember there was a movie we have, what was it called, Insurrection or something? The, Insurrection, The yeah. Star Trek movie? Yeah, Star Trek. Where Picard and the next generation, they all come down to this place, and it seems like there's these primitive people that don't have warp drive and all this and this, and, and basically, Picard is kind of shocked when, when this woman in the group basically says, uh, why would we need warp drive? Where is there to go? <laughs> Talk about, undo the whole Star Trek is based on, you know, the go galaxies where no man has gone before and everything, and here's this woman in total grace and presence, why would we need warp drive? Where is there to go? And then she slows down time in her mind and takes him Captain Picard into the holy instant. He's like, you know, he thought they were so primitive. <laughs> it's like, oh no, no, everything is backwards and upside down about the, this world. And when she slows time down, he just feels all this love. And, you know, that's a, there's so many great symbols throughout the movie that we're here for love and appreciation. We're not here to achieve and, you know, rejoice in technology and all kinds of things of the earth, we're here to rejoice in love, divine love, and wake up to it, and then let love use, use the symbols. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes? So, Dave, uh, do we have to expose ego in order to undo it, or can we just overlook ego, like, without our own aware? Well, there have been course teachers and who have emphasized their entire life the exposure of the ego, and that's because of the denial. You know, even Hella Schuckman woke up one day with like blazing uh, letters. You know, never underestimate the power of den denial. But I will tell you that that actually exposing the ego is not the whole story of forgiveness. In fact, that's just the preliminaries. What forgiveness actually is, is being so linked in with the Holy Spirit, the one, the Spirit, that overlooks the error and sees the impossibility of the error. That's what forgiveness is. So I think with a lot of psychotherapies, a lot of people who work with the Course, there it's, it, it's very important, yes, but it's almost like at some point you have to spring to the actual forgiveness which is, do not see error. He's even italicized it. You have to reach a state of purity and innocence where your mind becomes so unified that you can't even perceive the error anymore. Remember, the, the definition of forgiveness is you forgive what has never occurred. So you know there's got to be something beyond the exposing. So, what I find is a lot of people all over the planet are when they really give themselves over to spirit, all the darkness comes up, and it's just like you're caught in this thing of like, oh hell, what have I done? What have I taken the lid off of this dark 
cauldron and pit than what did I think I was doing. Life was better when I had the lid on. Uh, so they're like praying, help me put the lid back on. And, and the spirit's like, oh no, you're not going that way. That's not the direction. So this is where we need to make it a priority to come together because what I'm really talking about when I talk about the quantum field, when I, you know, we've got these great books out, quantum forgiveness, movies to watch, we've got all these spectacular tools, mystical mind training, it goes on and on and on, unwind your mind. All of these are very direct routes to coming to a state of mind that sees past the error entirely. Because as long as you're still spotting it, if you spot it, you got it. If you perceive it, you believe it. If you perceive drama, you've got a major drama going on in consciousness. And, and I'm still saying it, it has to be allowed, like we were talking allowance, you have to allow it to come up. But you can't linger with it. You know, you have to really train your mind and be willing to choose again, you know, to, to do that. And then, I would say the more you get into your function, the more you get into true empathy, where your whole focus becomes extending, giving, lining up with spirit. You know, you're not doing it part-time. You know, suddenly it's full-time. And when I say full-time, you know, over the years I've worked with a lot of different people, and they, one of the common defenses at the early years when I was working with people in the early 1990s was, David, you can do that with your life and your lifestyle and your circumstances. I even had students that would say, if I had your circumstances, I could be as happy as you. <laughs> it's my circumstances that limit me. And I say, hmm. Did you ever listen to Marion Williamson that happiness is not circumstance dependent? You know, that you can't have happiness if it depends on your circumstances, because that's just like saying the form is the cause, and my mind is at the mercy of the form that my life seems to take. Talk about a victim. That's just like putting yourself in the victim role, and victim to the world, victim to circumstance. So I had many people that would say to me, I have very unfavorable circumstances, and I would say, no. In fact, to prove it, I would go right in the middle of their circumstances, and, and I would say, just come and join me. I remember, I think I was in Oklahoma, and this therapist, had invited me over to her house, and I met her husband, and he went off, and then we were there. We were sitting there at her kitchen table, and uh, having a, a nice deep conversation, and she had put her young child in a, one of those little, uh, child little chairs, was right there, and, and had given the child a drink in a sipper cup, you know, the little sipper cup, so they you know, had the stuff flying all over it. And she'd done the good mom thing. She really, everything was real. And so he's sitting there, and we're talking. We're totally engaged in everything. And he's just looking at us. He's all excited. <laughs> and so he takes the sipper cup. He wants to get involved in the scene a little bit. And so he starts putting as much liquid as he can get out of the sipper cup onto, his, onto the table right in front of us. And he's doing it and doing it, and she's so engaged with me, we're talking, and I can see him out of the corner of my eye, he's just, I'm going to get involved in this scene. And, and more and more and more and more, and then, as he looks around, he takes both hands in the air, and he goes, boom, right on. And it was, it was Pepsi. The Pepsi was flying all over, flew in her hair, flew, I think I had a beard at the time, flew in my beard, flew in my eye, and everything like this. And I just continued on talking. And she said, this is what I'm talking about, baby. How can you be peaceful <laughs> for this kind of stuff? And I was just saying, what's wrong with this? I said, a little Pepsi in the eye. I said, you know, it, it was, you, you have to get to the point where you transcend the idea of judging that something's going wrong, you know? And, and then also you start to follow your heart and you live by that integrity, that flow, which is your peace of mind. You keep listening to that inner guidance, you act, and, and all your behavior, everything flows from that. And that brings you into a peaceful perception of the world. And when that happens, you're invulnerable. In fact, that's an actual teaching from A Course in Miracles. Jesus said, make your invulnerability manifest. Wow. That's spectacular. That's like a teacher of truth. Make your invulnerability manifest. 
how many teachers have we heard and people that work with healing and everything where they're always emphasizing be vulnerable, be vulnerable, be vulnerable. And then here comes the teacher of truth saying make your invulnerability manifest. So there's two parts. One is don't hide and protect and push those in those those vulnerabilities down and pr try to pretend oh it's all nice, all sweet, everything's hunky dory, pretend, pretend. You do have to expose, but also to keep in mind, wow, I have a function here. My function is to join with my brothers and sisters. My function is to extend this feeling of love that I have that wants to just expand and extend and let those situations and opportunities come in. Because in the end, life is not linear at all. It's this whole cosmos is holographic and this whole cosmos is a reflection of consciousness. So, as Jesus says, if you want only love, you will see nothing else. It's back to that, what is my desire? Let thine eye be single. Let my heart be purified. Let my devotion be singular. If you go for that, wing, the whole universe is going to change. Because it has to. Because the mind is that powerful. You cannot be held back. So, it's like a two-part thing. You know, I, when people are talking, you know, I'm at the monastery, I mean, a lot of groups I've led and sessions, people have all kinds of emotions come up. Screaming, shouting. Yeah, one day at the monastery, you know, Lisa and I were there and we heard all this screaming, screaming, blood-curdling, screaming, screaming going on. And Lisa looks at me and she said, who died? And it was this wife uh, was on her browser of her computer and, and all of a sudden she typed in, you know, the browser fills in from memory to type something and, and the porn site came up. It was her and her husband's computer and all the, it was, oh, well, here we go, it's a porn day. Okay, you have the porn thoughts today. Okay, you know, you, you have to be aware that here we go, you know, these kind of things are going to come up. Nothing's by accident. It's just you're, you're ready, you're calling it forth to let it go. To not be personal with it, but to, to see it from a higher perspective and just see they're just thoughts. You know, there aren't even real thoughts. You know, how can you get so caught up over thoughts that aren't even real? Uh, I was mentioning that recently, that example too. I was in Australia and I was like doing a, a week-long retreat, I think in Noosa years ago, and some man came, I can't remember his name now, but he came in the middle of the week and he's like, could I please come in and I wanted to be part of your expression sessions and no people pleasing. And I, I opened it up to the group because you know they're all there for a week retreat and they said, come on, let him in. Come on, David, let him in, let him in. I said, okay, come on in. He comes in, he starts right in the next day with all of his pedophile thoughts, uh, exposing all of his pedophile thoughts. Well, I had mothers and everything coming up for counseling and it was just, you know, again, for the healing. It's just thoughts. But when we give reality to those thoughts, that's where the guilt comes in. God didn't create any of them. God wants us to know our perfect innocence. But we have to, as long as we push thoughts out of awareness, we believe they're real. We believe they're dark. And we believe they have to be hidden. But the atonement is underneath those hidden dark thoughts. We're not going to get to the atonement unless we allow those dark thoughts up too. So, so it's again to use the word Rick brought up, allowance. There has to be a huge allowance in this healing process. And when we have that huge allowance, we, we are with the Spirit. We can handle anything. We, we cannot be stopped. We cannot be held back. It's just totally amazing. I want to talk about studying the Course. Is it something that we need to continue doing? I met people, they said they studied for 20 or 30 years. And, but, my, my training is more like an Eastern philosophy. And, it's like, I always think there should be a moment where I get it all like a enlightenment, like an epiphany. So I'm not really clear about that. Like, is it something that we can study for life? Is there 
pour something that has different layers? Is it something that I, the more you study it, the more it uncovers, the more it becomes, a, you, the more you become aware? I don't know, you've been studying the Course for a long time, I haven't. I would say it's, the Course is, like everything in form, it's just a reflection of, of thought. So it's more of, I would say, the grasping, the core principle, the core principle of the ideas, and then applying that with everything you've got. So what I say is, to me, spiritual journey, and course included, is 1% principle and 99% practice. Now the study of A Course in Miracles is just mainly, the, the text will say, is mainly to zoom in on that principle. Because there have been legendary teachers of the Course that have still struggled with that 1%. They still got caught up in lawsuits, they still got caught up in attack and defense, and lots of things, because they didn't fully grasp, they still had a distortion of level confusion and some things that are very, very important about the Course. And then, the 99% is the transfer of training, is taking that principle and applying it without exception. That's what the workbook is. So, it's, I think in terms of studying it, you know, I've tried to share with all the teachings and writings and books and videos and audios to really help everybody get a clear grasp of that 1%. Even if people didn't read the course and they watched a bunch of my videos and they went, I'm okay, I, I'm, I'm zooming in on that 1%, that's a good start. Then, not make any exceptions to that principle, that core principle that there's only the mind is causative. It's all just facing your thoughts. It's not really about trying to change the form or circumstances, it's, it's really transferring the training. How has that gone in my life? My life was, yeah, right, many years of studying and practicing the Course, lots of silence, a pretty much a solitary journey for much of it, and so on and so forth, but now, that's just the way the parable of David went. I find the people that I meet, like Nikita and lots of the ones that I meet, they're just showing up as reflections of like, okay, this is it, I'm going to go for this. It's not a matter of the book. It's not a matter of, of years of study. Uh, in fact, I'll get indigos and crystal children and, and a lot of young people. Uh, I had, I had a young man that came to one of my course groups years ago, and he, I think he was maybe a teenager, maybe 18, 19, and he walked in the room. I had heard about him because the people that were hosting him at their healing center were terrified of him. And he walked in, and he, he walked through the store, and he read everybody's mind in the store. And, and the owners were terrified, and basically said, come back for David's Course in Miracles group. And they shooshed him out of there. He was terrified of the kid, because he was reading thoughts like Jesus was doing with the Pharisees and scribes. So then when he came to the group, with my group and everything, we went around, and everybody had their course books. He sat down with all of us. They never met him. I never met him. I just gave him a big hug, welcomed him to the group. And he went around the whole group, one by one, and read everybody's thoughts. You're thinking this now. You're thinking this. It was like a powder telepathic experience, and the course group got frightened. <laughs> then, he scared the course group, and I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, this is the teaching of one mind here, what? <laughs> no private thoughts, like, what's going on? This is to the course group, don't, get, don't start projecting onto this. And so yet they were all, you know, shaking, and so he got up and he, he went outside, but I, I knew he'd be back, and then he came back with a, with a photo album, of um, all these photos, filling up a photo album, of him sitting out in a field with hundreds of butterflies all over his body. That's what the course group needed, to know that he was okay. Anybody who sits out in a field with hundreds of butterflies on him is like, okay, this isn't spooky. You see, it's, it doesn't really have anything to do ultimately with words. It comes down to what is the prayer of your heart. And when you have the prayer of the heart for that, the Eastern symbols, you know, it can come 
you're just going to really let it come in the way that it can come. And you don't have to so much in the end identify with a particular path. At some point, you get into the very end of the workbook of the Course, you know, which is basically this holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge. It's basically, that's how the workbook ends, is saying, Holy Spirit, you direct all subsequent lessons for me. That the only thing the Course is to do is to put you in touch with the internal teacher. You're not meant to be like, necessarily locked into it, you know, in the sense that this is my path, this is my practice. If you're really willing to go with that, with, with sharing and extending and being used and opening up in ways, then that's the way it will be. And so that idea of no private thoughts, people pleasing I can kind of understand a little bit more on how to apply that. But like no private thoughts, is that like most people in our lives don't practice the Course in Miracles, so is no private thought something that we would be just practicing with the Holy Spirit? like exposing my private thoughts to the Spirit, or at some point is it valuable to join with brothers and expose private thoughts that way? Because I know you guys do that in community a lot, where you join together and you do expression sessions and you join and, ex and express. So practically to apply that, if, if that's to be like, what's the most helpful use of no private thoughts in our daily lives? Yes, yeah, it's good. So the, the workbook is the place where Jesus says, you have no private thoughts, and yet that is all that you are aware of. So, <laughs> he gives you these like, whoa. <laughs> and, which means that, I would say, in typical families, and, and typical settings, work settings, and with friends who aren't into the Course, or, or spirituality, or metaphysics, it's, it's really a discernment uh, lesson. And it's a version of that workbook lesson, I will step back and let him lead the way. Because it's not, there's no value in, in trying to expose private thoughts, uh, except to the Holy Spirit. And, and when you have the symbol of a trusted friend, someone who's really connected with you in the mind training, and you can feel the safety and trust of opening your heart up, uh, it's very much like the in the Catholic Church they have the confessional. You know, you're supposed to you, tr you trust the priest. You trust that you're not going to pour out everything, and then the priest is like gets out the sofa. Oh my God! You <laughs> don't believe that? He just told me. You know, that there's a trust that's there, and and yet there's also a, an allowance there when you allow that up, and it's more of a symbol of doing it with somebody. Of course, there's nothing special about the form, but it is about opening up and giving it to the Holy Spirit, when you would hide certain thoughts, and, and hide them and protect them, then that's really saying you don't want to give them to the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit will help it be seen that they're not real, and that you're innocent. But it's kind of a step. So I think um, oftentimes if there's not a sense of community around you like that, then just with a trusted friend, or maybe at like the Unwind Your Mind group, it could be open up more to an expression instead of just study, but it actually gets into expressions and practical application and sharing the miracles of, of how helpful that was. But uh, yeah, there's nothing sp special about uh, doing it with a particular person. It's more the intention is really to give it over to the Holy Spirit. You know, just to follow that up in the expression group. But I would imagine that some of these expressions, you know, like the pedophile one mm -hmm. you mentioned, would really trigger people. Yes. And then, you know, you need to know what to do with that. Yes. Other than simply express, I'm really triggered, and, uh, you know, they may want to storm out, or you never know. Yeah. So I'm just curious, how does that go? Because you've had experience. Yeah, it takes, it takes a, a lot of, the more that you have the depth of, of witnessing, of, of holding the presence, of love in a non-judgmental loving way, that's that's really where the healing power is, is in the power of witnessing and non-judging. So that's very helpful for people that maybe have hid and protected thoughts for years. Or people, I've done some long retreats sometimes where I'll just open it up. I think I was in Australia one time, I opened it up and there was a 
whole bunch of people wanted one-on-ones with me, like 30-some people or whatever. I ended up having these short one-on-ones. But even in short 10-minute one-on-ones, they would feel safe enough, comfortable enough, not judged, and they would bring up all their deepest, darkest secrets and kind of just give me a look right before doing it, like, will you still love me after I tell you this? And then feeling, oh yeah, this guy is not going <laughs> to not going to judge me, he'll love me no matter what. And then it's quite a powerful experience when something like that is exposed and, and there's the presence of love there, then there's like a release feeling. So that's the intention behind it and I think, you know, for those that are in the course, if you did a word search and you found different parts in the course, in the text where Jesus talks about the, that, is he's basically saying, you know, would you know what the experience of like is like where you hide nothing from any anyone, where you, you know, basically can give and extend the love everywhere. If to to realize this, you must have no thoughts that you would keep hidden and protected. So there's those key words again, hidden and protected. That's what we're undoing with our guidance and our practice. We're we're learning not to hide and protect the thoughts anymore, and through that experience. Of, of having witnesses that are loving, accepting reflections, that helps ch change our mind. It's a very convincing experience. But it, it's, it's highly individualized. Uh, you know, I've had some people that have just attended one night of, of a two-night session, and I'm talking all about re releasing and exposing private thoughts. They go rushing off to their girlfriend, <laughs> pour out every thought they've ever had, and come back and say, that didn't go very well. Uh, is there something I'm missing? I said, yes, in part two tonight we're talking about discernment. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's all a learning. It's a learning and a growing experience. Because obviously, the whole world is built on the belief in private minds and private thoughts. That's why we have private houses, private bodies, private bank accounts, private anything. Sometimes, even course groups. That's a closed group. What? A closed course group is private. You know, it's, it, just, it just goes on and on, but that's the ego's world. It, it just built a reflection of the belief in private minds and private thoughts. Just to, to one last part of it, I think it's the last thing, that say someone shares something that, that's outrageous and it triggers several people, would the next step be that those people would could choose to say, express that they've just been triggered, and bring that in as part of what their expression is, like that. Yeah, it's all possible. people just sit with their judgments, you know. Yeah, exactly. Smile or not smile. Exactly. Sometimes, just like with course groups, occasionally a facilitator will emerge in a course group that'll kind of keep people on track, and like, okay, let's, let's come back to the text or so forth. The same can happen where you have if you just even symbolically have one person who's really there holding the presence, you know, it's very strong. And, and it's almost like there's an allowance for people to say, oh, I'm noticing, I just reacted to what you said, and but there's a presence that's underneath it. That's the most important thing, is remembering the purpose for it, is for forgiveness, is for this witnessing, this non-judgmental win witnessing. It reminds me, I mean, that the way I got led into how powerful it was, was just through guidance. One time I was at home, just sitting on the couch, and the Holy Spirit said, okay, get the remote and turn on the television, and so I turned it on, and he said, now go to the Jerry Springer show. I'm like, <laughs> so I go over to the Jerry Springer show, and, and uh, it was, uh, uh, the, that particular one was, it was, a, it was a show on polygamy, and they had a, a husband up there with like 23 wives or something, and all these children up there, and they're all openly expressing how helpful, and they're very serene. The children are very serene, the wives are serene, and the husband is serene. Jerry's getting agitated, and the audience <laughs> is furious. Uh, they're all raging, and um, so just mind watcher. Like, oh, very interesting, and then finally, um, Jerry is, was reflective, said, why are we all so angry here? And started to look at what is the source of all this anger. 
and jealousy and different things. It was quite an interesting public show. Another time I, I had the Holy Spirit said, turn on Oprah, and I turned it on, and they chose to do a show on religion. Well, they got into different religions, and and the emotions were high, and the anger started to rise, and you know even the camera started to to shake. You know, <laughs> they're like, like you know, on Oprah <laughs> discussing religion, and then finally, uh, some lady stood up in the audience and said, "Jesus Christ is the only way to God, and if you don't follow Jesus, you're going to hell." Well, then the camera, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was like throwing gasoline on the, the whole discussion, and it was camera was shaking, and then. All I could remember was doing a Oprah going, Jesus, if you're there, help us. And then <laughs> they cut to a commercial. Because <laughs> the camera was shaking. You know, I said, it's a good mind watcher. Then when I came back for the, after that, they brought in the panel of experts, all these religious experts. And they got into it. They were like arguing and screaming and shaking fists and everything. But there was one man that was sitting in the middle of the panel who didn't say a single word, just smiled, just going like this while it, while it was all going on. And the Holy Spirit was like, see this guy? This is, this is why you tuned this one I'm showing you. This is what it's all about. It was about not taking a stand, not taking a side, not getting caught up in theology. You know, all the things that happen with theologies and religions, you know, it was, it was a huge demonstration of peace of mind, like the eye of the storm. And so I, that's how I got into all this. The Spirit would, Jesus has been directing the show, like, do this, go here. One time I went to Vegas, the first time I went to Vegas, because I was down there with Joel and some friends recently. I'm driving across with a friend towards California, and I'm, I'm just on the highway, just right near Vegas driving, and then Jesus is like, pull off. I'm like, oh, yeah, Las Vegas, pull off. And so. Off I go, and I come, come around and start heading towards Vegas, and then I get a, a traffic light and I'm stopped there, and it was one of these, like, hotels that had this huge, like, three-story high, whatever, two-story high, big, high digital screen um, TV there. And so I'm sitting there looking at this, and it's a wedding scene. It's a bride and a groom, and they're throwing rice, and it's all this and this, and I'm just watching, and then this Course of Miracles blue comes up over the, and the, they disappear, and it's all just Course of Miracles, like this royal blue. I'm like still waiting at the light. Then one word rises up in white. Huge, massive word in the middle of the Course of Miracles blue. Illusion. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, first trip to Vegas, got it. And then Jesus said, now turn left. I turn left, and said, I'll turn left, turn left. He took me right on the highway, back <laughs> to California. That's what I got in Las Vegas. <laughs> Wedding, illusion, out. Now here we go, off to the, on the rest part of it. So I've had a lot of experiences that have come just from listening, following. That's what I mean by practical application. Like, staying in that show me. Okay, I'm studying, I'm, I'm opening, now you show me. You lead the way. That's the way our life is meant to be, just one lesson after the next, where we're just shown. Make it obvious. Make it obvious, make it obvious. You know, that's how we're, we're taken out of the perception of, a, of distortion back into that unified awareness. It's just like that movie, L.A. Story. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Love that. That was, that's in my movie watch. L.A. Story right? movie. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> I think, I, I'm thinking lately, I think I, think I should do a... A music Lover's Guide to Enlightenment. Because um, that, before the course and before the movies, and even my studies in metaphysics and everything, it was the music. It was like God singing to me, you know, just lately. And then lately getting a, an Apple subscription where you can just go on there and you're in the mood for a song, whatever it is, Love and Spoonful, or you can go right and boom, there you've got it. But the way that it's gone with with the gatherings and then the movie watchers guide to enlightenment that I think it's getting so strong with our commentary of, of movies and that it's kind of like it started off for me with the course but now it's evolved into all these things that are pouring through me all these gifts so that 
a lot of people around the world now are, have decided that they've looked at all the pathways, meditation and, and groups and, and all different ways, psychotherapy and psychodrama and all the different ways, and they've decided that they want movie watching as their pathway to God, that they enjoy movies that much. So basically with the commentary, that's almost becoming like a new pathway to God. Not very traditional, most people don't think of watching movies to wake up. They think of it as more as entertainment or distraction, which is the ego's use of movies, but we're using them with high commentary, so we have people springing into mystical states and having huge advances. Like I mentioned, that one woman who went into remission with her cancer after we were just doing a movie a night, and it's so mind-altering and mind-opening in the sense it's, it's just willingness to let the, the symbols of the world, the parables of the world, be used in a very focused, directed way. So a lot of times people just go to mwge.org and then they, they don't even know what they're in for the ride of their life. They, they get in there and they go, oh my God, what is this? And they start watching these movies with setups, with pauses and commentaries and afterwards and they have these huge awakenings. So that's that's another way that you could, we were talking about studying the book, but you could even have, you could have little expression session groups, you could have movie groups where you come together and kind of all go into the experience together. Uh, in a, in a, it's a very helpful use of time it's, and most people find it very enjoyable too. They're very relaxed during the movies. You know, they think, hmm. This is a nice way. I have trouble staying awake with meditation. I don't like to go to church, the synagogue anymore. I'm getting tired of my course group, actually, but uh, it's a little bland. Movie watching, guide to enlightenment, what's this? <laughs> so you see how the Spirit will use whatever, it uses what your interests are, and then takes those interests and uses it in a, a very helpful way. So that's kind of an interesting thing about the Spirit, just using whatever you have an interest in to take you beyond, well beyond those, those ego interests. Okay. And the people-pleasing. Yes. And the people-pleasing. <coughs> people <-pleasing. laughs> yeah, that's a thick one, people-pleasing. Well, it's, it's part of the, the social kind of seeming interactions where the ego set up the world where it was shaky about its identity, so the, uh, you might say that the identity was completely blocked from awareness and then dispersed throughout the cosmos. So it's like six billion aspects of yourself out there which can get pretty confusing and there's oftentimes an ego sense of wanting to use people and relationships as part of holding on this false concept. So. Jesus talks about that, I think in Lesson 50, um, I am sustained by the love of God. He says, in this world you are, you are believe you are sustained by everything but God. And he mentions um, being light in there, and he mentions knowing the right people. That's an interesting expression from Jesus as defenses against the light. Being light and knowing the right people. It seems like such a common thing. Of course I want to be liked. Well, that believing that, that your identity is based on being liked by other people is, is a part of the whole ego system. And knowing the right people, you can see with fame and different associations of money, fame, different sex appeal, all these things, the ego is trying to prop up an identity based on that as well. So the answer is always getting deeper into your purpose and your function which we were just talking about earlier, your passion, your calling, where there's that strong feeling of, of what it is that you have to give and to extend, and then it draws the mind away from those other kind of uh, affiliations and associations. It's very freeing. So then you're, you notice it's, it brings an end to self-deception. You, know, you don't have to try to distort the truth, you don't have to try to stretch anything, you don't have to try to play to the crowd or, you know, how it gets in those seeming interdependent relationships where 
you're walking on a fine line, uh, trying to keep the balance of give and take, and you're wanting to get into that give, that true giving, which is from your heart, which washes away those other props. You don't need to, oh, I need this affiliation with these people, or these churches, or these friends, or whatever. And then the fear that you could lose those associations. When in fact, when you get into your purpose, lots of things may fall away. It doesn't matter. It won't matter. You look at your old Facebook and you go, well, maybe I need a new Facebook. Or no Fine. Facebook. Or no Facebook. <laughs> no Facebook. <laughs> right. Maybe things have changed so much. Yeah. yeah. It's not relevant anymore. It comes from, you know, the people pleasing is from that deep unworthiness. Basically, I don't want conflict. I don't want you to know who I am. I don't want you to know my, you know what I mean? And so let me, and everybody's so, you know, you can juggle in front of everybody. Everybody's got different needs. And that, that sense of like something is happening because I'm caring for stuff, you know, I'm directly affecting somebody's life. And ultimately, it's ultimately for myself, it covers this incredible rage, anger. I'm choked. Know, and, and that's what it seems to cover. This kind of nicey nicey stuff, trying to say the right thing, the right person so nobody gets upset and then I don't go away feeling like I you know <coughs> and then the reality is I want to scream at the top of my lungs that I'm really upset that you know oh, yeah. and that that's not going anywhere. No mm. amount of like this is taking this rage out so far. Yeah. Right? And somehow I use it in a creative sense. Sometimes I use it for the right reason. That rage is, a, you know, it's an energy. I don't even look at it as rage. I just know it's there. Yeah. And I'm afraid of it coming out. I'm afraid of myself if that rage unleashes and I'm, and it, you know, before it dissolves. Just kind of, just keep it there. Just hang on. You'll get enlightened and get let go of this stuff. You'll get enlightened before you get angry, you know. <laughs> I'll get enlightened before I get angry. So if I get angry, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of energy that, that it's it's this unconscious rage that's down there, and it's so covered up and it's so buried, and with layers and layers of keep it together, keep control, wear the mask, be nice. It's just it's like conceptions. There's so many layers there that that it's almost a sign when you're giving yourself willingness to get in touch with it. You're even allowing it to come into awareness. It's a great sign that it's on its way out. If it's on its way up, then it's on its way out. When it's out of awareness and covered and buried, it's it's going nowhere fast. So, um, there's a movie that you all might enjoy in terms of that, which came across my awareness a while back, called Perfect Sense. And basically, this is a fantastic movie because it's this thing where, during the movie, there's all these pent-up emotions that have been pushed out of awareness. and in the movie, these emotions come, the rage, the, all the different pent-up emotions come up. And not just, it starts off with a few people and then it's global. The whole planet, everyone on the planet experiences this intensity and then they lose a sense, one of the five senses, after it comes up. Then they, life, they kind of adapt, the whole world adapts and adjusts to, to life without that sense. And then here comes again another wave of this intense bottled up emotion and they lose another sense. And then it goes on a little bit, adapt and adjust, then comes up again, they lose the third sense. <laughs> They're like, talk about letting go. <laughs> Imagine that you have this intensity that you can already deal with and followed by loss of one of the senses. So then the fourth, then they have another wave that comes up and the fourth sense is lost. And then, there's been so much clearing with those four things, that all this intense love and joining just comes pouring up. Just, you know, which was blocked before, now it's been cleared out by these three emotional releases, globally, worldwide, and all these adaptations that the world tries to adjust, the fourth one, there's all this love, like an immense, urge for the miracle to go and shine and share and connect. And then in the fourth sense is lost and then and that's how the movie ends is is the fifth sense is lost. 
fantastic. Absolutely, sense. yeah, perfect, perfect sense. sense. A fantastic movie. Talk about a mind watcher. As the human race loses all of its senses and gets, in the end, cleared out of all of the darkness and guilt and fear and, and burst forth into love and recognition after all five senses are gone. <laughs> Talk about the spirit turning the table on the ego where everything's backwards and upside down. It was just, it's like flipping the whole world right side up. But those are things. And amazing. there's another component to that movie with everything that's happening with all the waves of emotions. After each one, just with, it's like, it's obvious that there's a shift in consciousness happening. It almost like, it feels like the whole world, the whole consciousness is forced into giving. So they couldn't even get even if they wanted to. So they have to, everyone is forced to give, 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 give. Like if you have business, what, what do you use it for? To give, to give. You can't get money because everything is crashing down. So like give, extend, and support. And that was like like the key with that movie too. And then even at some point it goes that two elements, there's still the ones that resist this and the ones that go with that flow and they just get into that flow of giving and like just saying like this is what it is and like and losing future like fu like what's going to happen in the future like the time collapse like the linear collapses with that mm -hmm. and the That's quote from cool. the course that goes with it where Jesus says in the course until you're willing to look at the full extent of your own self-hatred you will not be willing to let it go so it plays perfect into that because rage is something that's so pushed out of awareness. That's not in our conditioning, you know. Good little boys and girls don't rage. Right. Men and women aren't supposed to rage, so you know. Years of suppression. Yeah, we just project that out. We let terrorist rage, Hitler, right. you know, Mussolini. We just it's like, oh them, the, the wild, crazy terrorists. But but to face the rage within is what the spiritual journey really is about. And to me that's that's what through the use of music, movies, meditation, and all these expression sessions, it's like outlets for that. Sometimes too, like like the kid was saying this past year, where you just had intense feelings coming up and nothing going on on the screen, like no, like no reason, no earthly reason for such a. But but that was part of almost like perfect sense where you were like yeah, facing the, the deepest that. of the deep, like almost like going where you don't want to go, like feel like what I don't want to feel, I don't want to know about this, like all kind like um, sense of what were um, the latest ones, <laughs> mm, abuse, deep abuse, like a uh, sense of cruelty, abuse, um, loss. All of it, and it's like, and again, it was felt like this is not not something personal, like the almost like the scariest part. Why, why I was like, no, 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 I don't want to know this because it felt like it's not just the personal. It's like that's all there is. It's a, it's an experience. It's like it's a state of mind, and it's kind of like, and that's all there is. There's no more like good and bad. It was like that's all there is. All you know now, it's like in Lucy. All you know now is pain. That's all you know. And and so and so facing it all as it is, and uh, almost like not knowing where, like nothing in, in the form, nothing points to it, like nothing, like oh, it triggered, like so and so looked at me wrong, like none of that, and uh, and then uh, and kind of like surrender, and uh, and somehow and somehow like the whole thing is almost like uh, I, I don't know throughout the whole thing, I guess what. It, I discovered somehow, I, like I didn't try. It's like I didn't try to fix those feelings, or, like beliefs anymore. Like there's never not a way out. Like there's always a miracle, but it's a miracle. And then uh, through that, something comes in in a way like a seeming like step, like um, st like steps out of it, quick and a quick way out. And so and as soon and the thing kind of like it came down. Like the sooner you face it the quicker you get to get out like and and it's obvious too like it's like the steps like you don't sit in there like it's like now like take me out of it beyond like beyond away from these beliefs like away from these uh, thoughts and beliefs uh, away, like there's got to be a different experience but then it comes in also like 
like as an awareness that experientially and then if on that those steps they just reflect that like and like and do only that from that like do only that it's not like it could be this or that or many like do only that so yeah and it's so yeah it has been like perfect like perfect tense like a lot i've seen it i don't know four times in the past couple of weeks i think At you least. even had a bit yeah. of that too didn't you lose hearing or oh I'm, i've been beats. losing actual senses and i didn't even know that i think because uh, because uh, every time i would like eat or something uh, like i started noticing that i would get like looks like outraged looks um and i didn't know why and i guess because <laughs> Because I guess I was putting too much salt. I would just like put salt and more, <laughs> and that's what they were doing in the movie. Or sugar, like not like I, I eat sugar as it is, but I guess it was even more and more because it didn't taste. And then I guess like someone, I don't know, someone just mentioned it the other day. I think it was Emma. She's like, uh, you don't smell. I guess it affects your taste too. I was like, oh my god, that's what it is. Yeah, I be- I can barely taste. <laughs> Too, and then I was losing my, like I couldn't hear at all, and I didn't know like maybe there's actually something wrong with my ears. I thought like maybe there is because it's like first in one, then not at all. But throughout the whole thing, the funny thing was like let's say if it was something about my area, I would hear it like oh I hear everything, or if it was something like a movie, like a deep movie, it's like oh I would hear everything on the screen, and then boom again I'm deaf. But um, but the thing is, I'm like, okay, while I'm in Canada, I'm gonna check in, like, just for me, if something's wrong with my ears, nothing, of course, nothing. I'm like, well, it, uh, he looked at me, he's like, but, you know, I can do this and that, but you already know the answer, huh? I was like, yeah, like, there's, he's like, nothing wrong. I like, I knew that, but it was like, it was actually like, I was losing actual senses, and I, like, like, human senses and I'm, I'm not even gonna get into like identity not knowing like am I a girl or a boy it was like okay that was like okay forget about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's great that you have the symbols that you need all along to just reassure you your, your mind's going through a transformation but it's safe you know those little safe reminders it's yeah. safe it's safe yeah. you know it's making that transformation going through it and it's great to have those reflections coming back you know, assuring you, reminding you. That's almost been the way of, of all way showers that are here to remind us it's okay, it's all going perfectly. I just want to say thank you for sharing that. Thank you, really. <laughs> because I have been going through that for a while. Um, it's like sometimes I can hear something, but I don't hear. It's, it's not that I don't want to hear, but I hear there's something Helen Shackman went through that too, where she thought she'd gone blind, and they took her across the street and checked her all, checked on the neurology out, and everything was fine. So it's it's just all pointing to how everything's in mind. <coughs> so we're winding down right now, but I I would say that the the key point is is the more you can just focus on the mind training on on focus of pay attention to your thoughts and and your desire to, to exchange the thoughts that you think you think for your real thoughts, as that gets stronger and stronger, you, you will see amazing reflections coming back to you about the power of the mind, the true empowerment. And then, yeah, it's been our joy sharing as we travel and these retreats and devotionals and everything, but, and putting all this stuff online, all these tools, there's just so many of them. Mm-hmm. That could be something too. It's like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I had, 
kind of a very individual, solo, solitary journey with lots of quiet times and contemplation and facing things, but I realize the power of the miracle. It's, it's a very interpersonal experience. It's described that way in the Course. It's, it's something that you can feel a real shared collaboration with, and, and then taking some of these tools and then using them, things that resonate with you. Use what works. Find something that really works for you. Extend the joy of that, and call people in, invite people in to join you in that, and watch how it just does it of itself. The Spirit will just expand that as you move along. And, you know, it's fun not knowing. I think we've got next year maybe a documentary coming in. We're having a, a mystery school, a four-week mystery school coming in at the monastery down there in next, next May. Year. In a year. Yeah. In a year. Jimmy Twyman is going to try to organize something with us in around Park City and maybe do something nearby in conjunction at the monastery. There's just all kinds of fun things that are just coming in, springing in just beautifully, and, and it's all based on an, a warm invitation to join. Let's all join in this together. Let's turn this into a celebration of our awakening. And let's, wherever there's any kind of heaviness or stuck spot, we don't have to, we're not doing this alone. You know, we're walking to the light hand in hand, and it's glorious, and we should be able to celebrate every step of the way. And, and remember, plan A is living it. You know, when you're watching your emotions, if for some reason you feel heavy or unhappy, then just realize there's so much help available, and there's so much potential for joining, and it feels so good to be connected and doing this all together, like walking hand in hand doing it. And we love that. We just... We love it when we get emails, phone calls, people say, hey, I got an idea, what about this? That's the way these last 25 years of travel have gone for me. Oh, come here. Oh, the, you know, group decided here, oh, see if David can come up. And I said, yeah, why don't we do something on this weekend and I'll be able to fly in and it's just been really good. Nikita had a whole experience that got her up here, how many, two weeks or? I think it's been two and a half or two something. Two and a half weeks. They denied me my visa. <laughs> that was her. So I had to come. That here. was her reason for coming. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I got it. Wasn't denied. <laughs> she used the power of her mind. I, I didn't know they denied me. All I knew, I as far as I knew, as far as what I heard in my mind, it's a yes. Just you know, keep going. It's just one of the steps. All I knew that I got approved. That's what I heard. That's what I knew. So I just went with that. And and I was like, yeah, like, and I, they were interviewing me. I'm like, they're not supposed to interview me because like it's R1. It's not like a green card. <clears throat> and I'm like, but I was just so open. <laughs> and then and then at some, and then at some point they sent me a letter, like saying that they've originally denied me the visa. And but I didn't know, right? So I just went and I went with the yes. I'm like, yes, yes, yeah, I got it. I was approved, and here you go. And uh, and I got it. I actually got it. <laughs> but it was like it was quite easy. But it's like I'm like, oh wow, I didn't know. I, I thought it was like I heard it was a yes. It's like <laughs> so. that movie uh, Scarlett Johansson, Lucy. You know, she just goes, doesn't matter, police, immigration, detectives, or whatever. She's kind of looking like no reason what you're supposed to tell me. I'm waiting. Mm. Yes, okay, that's good. You know, it's like in Lucy, the movie Lucy. She basically, you know, can she sees that it's all consciousness and it's all her mind so everything is she's unaffected by everything and so that's, yeah, this has like, been a you chance you broke the rules you know like you broke the rules I'm like no sir it's like really explain it's like the, like mm -hmm. just very thorough the way I heard everything like say it as like I was just like like hear it just say it and then and then it's something like okay that's enough and I'm like I don't even know if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, but in two, I feel it's a good thing because it was like, I have no hook at you. It's like, there's nothing wrong. So it's like, okay, keep like, It's a good excuse going. to get you up here. You had a yeah. marvelous time up here in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spirit can yeah. whoosh you along. Yeah, and we have daughters adopted from the former USSR. Yeah. And they were
So thank you all for coming today. We have had a wonderful time. And the beat goes on.